Well, let's head over again. Here you go. This is Coffee with Holistic Dog Professionals. Learn from Roman and David how to become your dog's best friend. Hi everyone, this is Roman and David who is missing, but must be a reason, usually technical problems. However, I can introduce you today, our special guest, Daniel, who is owner and founder of Happy Buddha Dog Training. So, David, let me get rid of that perfect picture, gets you real here. How are you doing today? Good. How are you? I'm good. Thank so, you. Thanks first, for having me. <laughs> I, I so appreciate you finding the time today because we have a very, very difficult chapter to discuss today. How to address aggression without using aversion. Now, I think before we go deep into that chapter, I would like you to tell me a little bit about yourself so people recognizing your background. Sure. Well, I started out in law enforcement actually for 30 years. So I was working with a lot of aggressive people, or I should say people that behaved aggressively in certain circumstances. So I had to begin learning how to diffuse tension and how to communicate, how to understand what their motivation was. What was it that made them feel that they had to act out? And very often it came from frustration or misunderstanding or a lack of communication. So I, I learned how to deal with people to resolve aggressive behavior without having to become aggressive. And when I went into uh, studying dog training and behavior, I found a lot of similarities uh, between the two fields. And um, my great interest ultimately was in working with behavior cases. So I, when I got my behavior certification, probably 70% of my dogs on an annual basis have fear and anxiety and they constitute the, the primary reason most, most dogs resort to uh, aggressive behavior is that they're fearful of something. There are other reasons too, but um, I approach the issue from a behavioral assessment. I'm trying to understand what the motivation is for the behavior. What can we change in the environment how can we change the way that the animal feels about things through conditioning? And what skills can we teach the dog so we have different behaviors on cue so the dog sees the, the trigger and then behaves differently? I think this is a, a great point of yours because coming from a perspective that as law enforcement officer, and I, I don't know, the particular details of that job. I mean, everybody has a common sense, but there is a deeper understanding of, A, you have to be conscious about the social laws that are in place to protect people from themselves, right? And True. you're coming also from an angle of, you need to be empathetic, understanding the person's problems that he's struggling with that leads him to that particular behavior. And a classic right. example <clears throat> would be how people would judge a person stealing an apple from a supermarket. We have different versions of that. And a judge has to come up with a better understanding what is the motive of that person stealing and how to do the consequences of that. We're not saying punishment. We say the consequences, they are regulated by the law, right? So we're coming sure. from a dog's perspective and we say, my dog did a behavior. What was the reason of that? Um, hold on. Okay. And how does the dog feel about that? And how can he come in from a person that we judge him as comparison. Like the person steals an apple, comma, she is a female, comma, she has a baby, comma, she has no job, comma, she has no money, comma, she doesn't have a home, period. And then I come from a dog 
Dog is aggressive, comma, he is in pain, comma, he doesn't want to be touched, comma, he has allergies, comma, he has no safe place, comma, he beat someone, period. Yeah. And then we're coming in so harsh with judgment and say the dog is aggressive. Well, the mother is aggressive because if you try to take her apple away, she will bite. <laughs> she will resist because she has a purpose. There is a motivation here to save her child while the same mm -hmm. motivation has the dog to save his body or to save his family or to save his property because just as the law enforcement has a job to protect public property and individual people the dog has the same job so if i i'm lucky sometimes i have people who are in law enforcement or are you know people of in service i always ask the question how would you feel in that situation you're in your house somebody opens the door comes in you have your gun in your drawer of course the legal procedure what would you do if it's 12 o'clock at night and you have three kids in your home and you know there was a fight in the neighborhood last night what would your expectation be that noise that comes from downstairs would come next <laughs> right and then also yeah. i see where um First of all, I want to say hello to everyone here, Laura, uh, Leslie, and our fellow colleague. She has also a show, Amelia Johnson. Welcome. I love having awesome people on our show today because our show today basically discusses how to address aggression without aversive tools. We're not judging people. We're not judging the dogs. We just want to come from an angle, have people understand why dogs do certain behaviors and how do we approach them sometimes giving the dog a treat is the wrong choice sometimes punishing the dog is the wrong choice always usually a wrong choice uh, sometimes trying to correct the dog of that behavior is the wrong choice if we don't understand the basic function of that behavior so then um you're well uh, educated around behavior can you give us a simple explanation about functional behaviors why would the dog well, do the, something yeah self um, preservation is a great motivator and if a dog feels threatened it's going to display behaviors that might commonly be called aggressive but i, I like to, the term uh, agonistic meaning distance increasing yes. so i'll give you an example <laughs> yeah. It can be easy to confuse that because the dog might be freezing initially and then it might be barking, it might be growling, maybe lunging toward us and then retreating and maybe it's showing its teeth. And and if we encroach on the dog, it might have to, to amplify that communication. So now maybe it's nipping or it's actually tugging at our heels. And the whole purpose of that, if the dog is fearful of the person, for for example, is to create distance, make that scary person go away. And it usually works. So if you went to visit a friend and the dog came to the front door and, and you're going to probably see a, a picture of alarm on the dog's face. The eyes might flare, the dog might hunker down and lower its head and it's barking and it's lunging and it's growling and retreating. It's trying to make the scary person go away. Mm -hmm. And most people are not going to reach toward that dog or approach it. So they keep their distance or they step back. And that can persuade the dog that what they did worked. It, it gave them the extra space they needed. Um, so it's kind of like barking at the mailman who comes down the street. Right. So, you no, know, it's bark, 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 go away, go away, go away. And sure enough, the mailman goes away. And the dog can say, well, whew, that worked. I'm going to do that next time I'm upset or worried. So it becomes a self-reinforcing behavior. And the irony is the dog's not trying to initiate a conflict. It's trying to avoid conflict. So if, if our dog is barking and growling at the visitor and then we punish the dog, we might suppress that behavior in the moment, but we haven't helped the dog. We haven't removed the fear. We haven't developed any confidence, but we might convince the dog to stop giving warnings. And then they might go from that to a bite. I feel that is a very important part that you just touched. When, when a dog 
shows a behavior, it's always associated with an emotion. So when True. we when we zoom out of that situation, we see a dog, we see a trigger, we see a first response emotion. Will it kill me? Will it help me? Should I get more or should I get less? The, 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 there is a, a pathway in the brain that says, is it in my data? Do I know how I will end up with this? If the information is, no, you have no clue how it will end, the first response would be avoidance. And avoidance mm -hmm. can show in different ways. I can avoid things by looking away. Like, oh, I don't care about that. Avoidance can be, get away from me because I want to avoid you. I'm warning you because it's my safe place and I don't want you in here. So you're the intruder and I'm the victim. You deal with it because I will respond to it. And then mm -hmm. we come in as a parent, as a dog parent, as a trainer, as a behaviorist, as a veterinarian, and tell that dog who is in a survival mode and survival mode means everything is automated at that point the dog doesn't have a clear thought what it is he is basically in fight or flight situation okay he has no idea that he can ask for a favor or he can flirt with the situation all he has to do right now because his system tells him to do is fight run away or freeze now, how far can a dog go if he's confined in a room, a vet's office, a crate, on a leash? How far can the dog freeze if he's being choked at that same time? Now, that time, because people, when they get tense, they start pulling on the leash. The dog doesn't have any range to go. Even if the dog had the choice to walk away, we just there restrain him. We haven't rewarded the dog. We haven't punished the dog. All we do is we are in a fear response as well. So we have two people struggling here. The dog with the problem and you with the dog and the problem. Now, right. how can we be helpful at that point? What do you what, what do you suggestion would be in that moment situation where the poop hits the fan and I'm jumping off the plane without a parachute? What can I do? Yeah, I think... The, the first thing is to create some distance to remove the dog from the frightening trigger or to remove the trigger from the dog. And you might think there's a risk of reinforcing the behavior. And I've heard, mm -hmm. I've heard trainers and behavior consultants who work with aggressive behavior respond to that with, well, there, yeah, that's a possibility, but you're preventing the bite and the dog needs some distance or it can't, calm down and it can't think so it's right. just being practical um i thought you touched on a really important point too the emotional context so what i've learned from neuroscientists is that the brain has two ways of processing uh, information the emotional part of the brain is much faster than the thinking part of the brain so the, the prefrontal cortex might look at the mailman and think well he never actually comes into the house. I'm never actually in danger. He's never hurt me. In fact, he, he seems to wave and smile at me when he goes by. So I guess that's not a threat. Problem is the emotional part of the brain, the amygdala is already processing. It's kind of like the super highway. Right. Sees the strange strangers are novel. These are a threat. You have to make that scary thing go away. So you get the emotional response first and the, the thinking part of the brain can't really function until the dog feels safe and creating distance is a good way to diffuse things so that you can start working with the dog. So I made the chart here for, for a better understanding. Um, I hope you can see it. So looks great. Um, I feel we should recognize <clears throat> these three basic areas under threshold at threshold and over threshold and we have the stressor at that point it's a cat it could be a person it could be a sound it could be anything if we look <clears throat> the the thresholds from the physical perspective we usually see different stances of the dog the dog is relaxed in the green zone the dog is more tense on the yellow zone and the dog obviously shows clearly a, a, a behavior that we considered aggression, which I don't like the term because it's so human angled 
term, and I think I would call it reactivity, even if I call mm -hmm. it aggression here, because people are just more comfortable with the term. I clear up, I don't like that term, but anyway. Now, before each level, before each switching, we see that a dog has a moment that he switches from being confident and has no concerns and taking treats and rewards and follows intentions and his brain is 100% alert uh, in regards to his relationship, whoever is with him. There's a moment in time where the dog switches from being on the threshold of being at threshold. And I think this is where we'll usually fail as people because we wait the dog to react before we react. We're not being proactive. We always are reactive. So from a dog's perspective, if we look kind of like in a natural environment where dogs are together, like multiple dogs in a group of free roaming dogs, let's say in India or Pakistan, wherever, or Greece or Italy or Spain, there are a lot of dogs everywhere. Um, these dogs are very organized. They have this... Each dog has a position in that team. I don't call it pack because I don't feel the term is justifying the situation. So these are team of professionals that team up together to be more sufficient and survive. And we know from studies that those groups are between 3 and 13 based on their environmental factors, especially nutrients. Like if they have plenty of food, abundance of food, they're likely about 13. But if they're down to minimum, they're about 3. Now, we know that the dogs work in family systems. We have the offspring of the two parents and likely a first or second generation plus a couple of friends that join that family because of that safety feature. So dogs are not pack animals, they're family animals. And they have this non-linear hierarchy. So I'm trying to debug and quickly hear the dominance theory so we understand the concept. Now, if the dog is in a troubled situation, he's inclined for the last 40,000 years, the first thing to do is to reach out for help from his partners because his position in that situation right now is under threat. Is there anybody here to help me? So I'm coming back here to my screen that I say, you know what, the dog is not only fight, freeze, or flight. He also is flirting with the problem showing how he feels about the situation. Is he huckles up? Does he feel uh, incorrect position? Does he feel threatened? He shows his emotions. He's very honest about his feelings and expects the environment to respond to his feelings. So this is back and forth. This is still a communication level here. But how will the dog ask us for a favor to help him if we are never there for him, if we are always late? We're pushing the dog to a behavior he is inclined not to get into. So we are failing here as a support team. We want to be the alpha, some people call it. Some people want to, we want to be the boss. Like if I will be an employee in a company and my boss always fail to see my needs in my company, he's going to shut this business down and I will pay for it. If I want to be the alpha, I'm failing there right in the beginning because I don't see where the alpha comes in because I'm definitely the omega here. And then the other factor is, A, I don't have a tail. I don't look like a dog. I don't behave like a dog. I don't bark like a dog. I don't think like a dog. Like, I cannot even be a pack leader. So <laughs> what am I, in fact? What, what, what do you suggest here? What should people actually do to help the dog right in that moment in crisis? Is it something we should react or we should something that we should be proactive? I, I certainly think we need to be proactive, and I think in terms of uh, partnership. My two dogs uh, became therapy dogs, and we were a team. So if we accompanied our dogs to uh, a strange environment, like we might go to a maximum security prison yeah. or a nursing home, they're not places dogs usually find themselves. So they would check in with us quite regularly, making eye contact, and we would always be in close proximity. We'd have our hand on the dog. We'd be looking at them. We'd be talking to them. We're giving them guidance and support. So I think of it as a teamwork. And if you're with your dog and your dog's going over that emotional threshold and getting upset, first thing I would do is, is move away. And then I would think about what what exactly happened in the environment before my dog responded that way? Because that's going to tell you what the trigger is. And you can then either avoid that trigger in future 
or you could condition the dog to feel differently about it so that the trigger now produces something joyful that the dog enjoys. And you can teach the dog other behaviors like look at the trigger, look at me, or look at the trigger and put your nose to my, yeah, get my hand in there, put your nose to the palm of my hand. So now you have a behavior that turns you away from the trigger. Or maybe you see the trigger and then I scoot backwards and you approach me. So you're creating that distance that you need without conflict. So there are a number of ways you can approach this, but if you if you're blind to the the increasing stress signals, you're going to be surprised when the dog goes over threshold, and you may you might find yourself thinking, well, he he got aggressive for no reason, which is really a blind spot that that people have. Um, if you become more aware of how your dog is feeling and how they express feelings through body language, you can keep your dog from going over threshold most of the time. Sometimes something will happen that you have no control over. But usually you can see these things coming and head them off. And that's a great way for your dog to learn to be confident and to trust that you're going to take care of them so they don't have to do the heavy lifting. Right. I I had a, um, a colleague in Swiss who works with um, Bernese Mountain Dogs and um, Swiss um, and um, Mount Bern um, Swiss Mountain Dogs and well, I miss the name now. The fluffy ones, same same country, um, San Bernard. Okay. Oh, sure. And um, I, I told him, how do you guys train those dogs to be like help service dogs? It's like where we actually don't really do the training they're being trained by their team. So a dog has a choice. And to understand what the, do what the dog's supposed to do is they go outside and find somebody who is lost. It's not only one dog. There are multiple dogs going out there. So their job yeah. is to put the person in a sandwich between the two dogs. <laughs> and one dog is coming back for help. So these two dogs keep that person warm and the other dog is coming back for help. Wow. Which dog that will be, it's not their choice. It's what the dog likes to do. So when the puppies join the team, they either stay with the people with the other dogs or they return with the one dog bringing the people. And that's how the job description comes in. Each dog knows what to do. He has a choice which job he prefers to do. Does he like to stay with the people or does he like to come back home? And I was like, I never thought of that. I was thinking somebody mm. is there training the dog, giving him treats and doing conditioning in there. I was like, it makes totally sense. And I remember a story that I had with a friend of mine. Actually, I was raised next to um, a, a goat farm, like old fashioned Greek goat farms. I'm not a goat uh, herd, but I had nothing to do in the summer. So I would join him going out, out there and I got involved. That's what actually my first experience with dogs was with large breeds in that can uh, herding breeds, guardian dogs. And that's what he did. He had the dogs coming with him, joining that, what the dogs consider family. It's kind of like, um, um, in, um, Kurt, um, I, I miss my, I, my brain is off today. I didn't have enough coffee um, <laughs> about the imprinting where he says you, you are born in your environment. You are part of that. It doesn't matter if you're a, a, a goat or you're a dog, it's your family and you do what you see. You're behaving like a dog, but you are morally and ethical conditioned by your family environment. Do you kill your family members? No. Why not? Because it's family. Does the dog feel being a goat? No. Does the goat feel she's a dog? No. Everybody feels himself, but it's an important part of the family. So if we look on that aspect in a dog-human relationship, we see the dog doesn't feel like a human and a human shouldn't feel like a dog. Each one is individual, but they team up to fill those gaps in between that family system. So my dog sees uh -huh. better, my dog hears better, my dog reacts faster. I'm slower, but you know what? I'm the one who can open the door. Duh. I'm the <laughs> one who can feed the dog. I'm the one who can provide safety. I'm an important part too. Does my dog know that? 
am I giving him that clear information what I'm actually here to do? Because usually when I see people, the dog barks, people is like, oh, who is he barking at? Okay, that's a great thing to do. My dog wants to go out. He scratches the door and I'm opening the door. My dog is barking at me to give him food. Well, I am only reacting to his needs because he reacted to them. I'm not proactive. I'm not a parent at that point. I'm not even offering a service. I'm kind of like a, a, a bad behaved person who doesn't comply to his rules he set. Now, a dog likely will not see me as a guide and he will not see me as a parent. So if I go back to my threshold and I see if my dog is calm and then suddenly there is a trigger and I use this black bar with a yellow insert as the switching point where the dog question himself, am I alone here or do I have somebody that can help me? And if I'm not there and the dog doesn't know that I'm there, he will continue going at threshold because there is no one there to save him or to guide him out of the process. And usually the same dog is the one who never being taught troubleshooting skills. Obedience doesn't help the dog at that point because he has to make a decision and he's usually being micromanaged over the years because everybody wants to do the dog obedience, 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 but no social skills and no troubleshooting skills and no uh, self um, confidence. And the dog right there will mm -hmm. fail because the only thing he can do next is going to freeze, fight, or flight because nobody listens yes. to him. And so I thought I share with you my experience and maybe you guys can test it. And then of course um, I would love your feedback to that because I feel if we come from a perspective that we have a dog who only responds to fight, flight, or freeze, how can we teach the dog to show us the flirting part because I think here is where people usually switch to aversive tools. The dog fights, flights, or freezes. We don't get the dog's attention. We, we don't have the dog. We don't allow the dog to show us emotions. And then we start to using those tools because the dog will react and we have no control of it because the dog doesn't trust us to start with. And I think um, one exercise that I find very helpful is teaching the dog that we are part of that system and we are not here to make him feel bad we want him to encourage to show us his emotions because it's an important signal when the dog the moment he feels like holy bark it looks like a dog to me oh my god he's looking at me i'm on my leash i definitely will not go anywhere and this dog is not talking nice to me and then the, for a short period of time, the dog tries to communicate, but there is no feedback. So mm -hmm. I, I recognize the dogs have a faster processing system. What I measured using a high speed camera and recording dogs in a three second video, I measured 26 behaviors mm -hmm. in that period of time. To offer a behavior, it has to come with a decision. It has to come with a counter response. So if two dogs fighting with each other or play fighting with each other, there is, I see, I do, I counter react to your behavior. And I, I, I think I remembered back then, it was about 14 decisions per second. Hmm. And then I remember a, a BBC interview uh, or actually a report that I saw um, measuring the fastest thinking people and they took um air force pilot and a formula one pilot and they tested them how fast they can think and where the limitation of processing comes in and they were at seven to nine decisions per second i need three seconds to step on my freaking brakes if somebody in front of me steps on his brakes i'm really good at that <laughs> <laughs> so if we try to help the dog and we are too slow and we don't recognize that a dog can actually see the trajectory of a fly, open his mouth and catch the fly on passing by and we don't even see what happened. Mm -hmm. I'm going to miss the whole story that happens in front of me and I will be too late right. unless I can stop the time. 
and tell the dog, if you are about to make that decision to kill the fly, which I didn't see, I would like you to tell me that. Only mm -hmm. thing I want you to do is look at me. But it's not because I told you, it's because you wanted it to do. I hold that in space a little bit and, and forgive me because I have to go in a different direction. If we choose an aversive tool, an averse tool, sorry, mine. If I go to an averse tool and I try, ah, David, ah, David is back. David has problems logging in. We'll figure it out next time. So let's read that a little bit. We focus on counter conditioning, the negative, scary, and threatening association and pairing the trigger with what the dog loves the most at the distance, the dog is able to stay just below threshold, working within those parameters. You can systematically get closer to the trigger over time. What was once a trigger is now, end of story, obviously is safe. Now, going back to that, when, when people decide to use an aversive tools, I totally understand that. I was there, I did it, I, I, I'm, I'm a crossover. I was not proud what I did in the past because I thought I have to do what everybody tells me to do. Sure. If the dog makes a mistake, I have to get punished. I had books that I threw away because later I recognized they were written in an old black era of dog training from a belief system that is nothing to do with animals. It has to do with violence and terrorism and, you know. And I, mm -hmm. I came from an angle, I deserve the dog to follow me. I deserve, it's mine for the dog to comply because it's my dog, I bought him, I got him. It's, he has to comply, period. And if not, he has to be punished because he should know better. And I know some of you guys, are you crazy? That's common sense. Well, yeah, it was common sense, but you know what? I grew up in a family where you were being punished for making a mistake without explanation. Sure. Sometimes I was punished even without knowing my mistake, so I, obviously I felt guilty all the time. Now, when mm -hmm. we're going to a trainer's perspective or a client's perspective who says, you know what? My dog is bolting out the door every day. Are you kidding me? Do I kind of give him cookies and treats for him bolting out the door? He needs to know that this decision is a bad thing to do. He's going to kill him. I get it. Totally right. My question is, how does a dog get out of the door? Question number two, what is his incentive to get out of the door? Why is the dog making that decision that outrunning the door is better than staying in the door. Let's put that aside a little bit. Let's say, for example, we don't recognize that. Let's say, for example, you know, it's a quick fix because my neighbor told me that he sees the dog in his yard, he's going to shoot my dog, and we are in Texas, or he's in Texas, and of course he has the right to do it. So why dog in my field, boom, dog is dead. Are you going to seriously kind of negotiate what kind of positive reinforcement you should do to save your dog if your dog's life is at stake. And my next question is the trainers who go into the shelter says, you know what, I work with that pit. I work with that Corsa. I work with Grand Dane and that Mastiff. These are big dogs. You're not fool around with these things. He needs to have a choke collar. He needs to have a prong collar or he needs to have a shock collar. Because you know what, can you control a 250 pound dogs attacking you Right? This is all the questions I got that sometimes and sometimes I was in that position says, what do you do now? This dog, well, if that bolt doesn't hold, I'm dead. And you said very correctly, let's go to your job because you have been there with a hmm. person who has common human sense because he's a human. He has his family in danger. He, is, he wants to kill one of his family members because he just sees red about it because he's not conscious of his behavior. And you have to deal with that person putting yourself in danger to get shot. Why don't you shoot him right there? You're going to save his family. Why do you yeah. make that choice to negotiate with that person? That's a great question. And I actually have been in that position. So in my 30 years, there were a number of times I encountered people who were in a, a state of rage. Sometimes they were armed. Um, and three occasions I could have used deadly force. And I, I found alternative means that accomplished the same goal, which was to resolve the conflict. 
So in one case, uh, a man who was despondent, who had lost his job, he uh, suffered from alcoholism. His wife had just filed for divorce and he was homeless. He, uh, he'd been carrying a concealed weapon in the house where his friend was letting him stay and it was scaring him and the family. So he called the police and I went to talk with the man and the first thing he did was he drew his handgun. And so I had to make a, a quick decision. I either shoot him or I try to disarm him. And there's only a split second to make that decision. So I, I had the skill set, so I disarmed him. And the first thing he did was apologize. So he's crying like a, a child and he's apologizing. I think he wanted me to shoot him, suicide by police. So I didn't inflict any injury on him. I simply disarmed him and handcuffed him and never punished him. So hopefully he got My the help that he God, needed, he but he didn't need to be killed. He didn't need oh, violence. He just oh, needed, cool. needed <laughs> to intervene on his behalf. And I think the same way with dogs, if a dog is in that state where they're, they really have no other options or they're desperate and nobody's listening and they feel threatened, I don't see that punishment's gonna help. It can amplify the problem but from a pet owner's perspective, it might seem to be a, a solution because you could stop a dog from engaging in a behavior if you harm them badly enough in the moment with a shock collar or prong collar or something. So it can seem to the owner that they may have resolved the problem and that's pretty reinforcing for the owner. But in the long term, aversive methods cause more harm and uh, there's a lot of science behind that too and and like you roman i once used a choke collar on, on one of my dogs because that's what the trainer i had hired told me to do and i, I that was in the best interest of my dog's welfare but i could see my dog wasn't happy i wasn't happy it wasn't working and it was damaging our relationship so like you i, I put the training book in the, the garbage and i threw the choke collar in there as well. And I started learning about alternatives. What do you I think, so, David? I so appreciate you. Hi, first of all, hi, David. Jesus, we missed <laughs> you here. What happened? <laughs> uh, guys, so many issues. Uh, no need to waste time getting into it. But long story short, my messenger app was glitching on my eye. I had to use a friend's computer. And then we were having issues. Just getting on here now. I do apologize. I was listening, and um, you know, from you know, being a trainer, I get in a position where there's time and money that play a factor into trying to get behavior to happen. You know, patience needs to be first and foremost, not the calendar or the clock. Trying to get done, and that because people don't want to they just won't happen right now, it's like everything in the society is instant. So they think you can just under use a magic tool and just automatically change dog's behavior instead of trying to understand what's causing it. Security or fear, you know, and then people are so quick to add an aversive. Now the dog is even more fearful. So I got a terrible dog right now free and didn't want to leash, and it came to me on a prong collar. And because it, it's not that these people were mean, it's just they were confused. They're trying to address the pulling and not understand the temperament of the dog and how to even get the dog out of you. And people miss that arc as well. Trying to teach the dog to heal by adding all these corrections. Never at any point in time do they even teach that the hip is where they get fed. And even without a leash, you know, you get that to happen first. You know, you teach them where they're supposed to be, be the position. And then, okay, I know home base is bang right here. Instead of I'm confused and I just want to follow my instinct. 
Um, I was so um, changing association and taking those baby steps is what helps. You know? I to I totally agree with um, um, David. What do you think, Dan? I think David is spot on here. <clears throat> what I, I recognize was, and Dan, I think you have a better understanding from the human perspective, from a human psychology. When a person is in a state of survival, <clears throat> holding a gun, trying to get away with it, or try to give an end to it, or try to influence it, there is always a functional behavior behind that. I've I've personally been in a situation where I was standing on the bridge, wanted to stop things around me, and I just wanted to jump. And the train was coming, and I was just about to jump into it, making sure I'm in the right distance, you know, calculations, everything. I was an engineer back then. And at some point, I felt like, no. Something in me told me no. But I have this consciousness. Dogs have consciousness, too. Not to that extent that we have. We have these all configurations and, you know, all these abilities to multitask and multithink. Dogs can only do one thing at a time. That's the limitations I feel they have. And I also came into the, in the situation where I got emotionally triggered and I went into a PTSD mode. I have trauma from childhood. So at some point, something triggered me. And I got so violent that I basically punched into a door in order not to punch on a face. Mm -hmm. I had no control of that action. It literally yeah. came out of my hand. I, I regret that I did, A, because I had, it was my door. <laughs> it, I had to fix it afterwards. It cost me money. But right that moment, all it matters to me is to get that valve out and somewhere in other than to harm somebody. So my idea was not to harm someone, but at the same time, I had to get it out of my system because yeah. it was choking me. It was pressuring my neck. My anger went all over. And I can, thinking into that situation, I can feel like how warm I got into. I literally had a flame coming into myself. So we know that dogs have emotions and their emotional intelligence and they have, you know, go through this emotional experience just like a five-year-old including shame we see that a dog can be shamed for something that he did a dog can feel guilty for not being compliant to our expectations the dog can feel that if we're not appreciate him we will outcast him from the family and he's gonna die so us not doing things that leads to that peace and that feeling of safety and and care and nurturing is exactly as punishing as doing something to him so we have a physical punishment and an emotional punishment if we don't do things as much as we if we do things so if that person wanted to con con commit police suicide getting shot pretending he has a gun so you can kill him and you don't kill him He's being punished because he wanted to die and you didn't let him. Well, you're a bad person. <laughs> you didn't do him a favor. At the same time, if you would, then you both get punished. So sometimes we see there is a conflict from a human perspective, whether or not me to use an aversive tools or not. You could use the gun. You choose to disarm him. And disarming doesn't always mean you have to get into it. Sometimes you can stay out of it. Sometimes it could be, you know what? I don't give you that opportunity to blame me for being the aggressor makes me the victim. So you are the aggressor and I have rights. We can flip that around in the milliseconds if we assess the situation correctly. And I feel the size and the weight of the dog doesn't really matter of our choice because there is still a dog brain in here and it is still an emotional in here and there's still a whole mammal just like we are there trying to survive and i think uh, if we work with dogs and we want to make that choice using an aversion tool we need to consistently are aware what the consequences of that action is how would the dog perceive that how is our relationship with our dog 
being put in jeopardy because of that choice? What if I have to come to the conclusion before I win that war, before I win that battle, I need to be aware of my freaking armor and my tools. So I have to sometimes call it off, walk away, don't correct my dog, don't punish my dog, don't reward my dog, get him out of there first. Mm -hmm. Reevaluate the situation. Show him, like, I'm here to help you, even if I have to use force to get you out of there. Just like force uh, um, a rescue person would do to tie you up on a sheet of block of wood to save you out of the sinking boat. So we have a good force and we have a negative force, a force that confines you and saves you from your own action towards yourself and directly to others without using punishment. Because I don't see a punishment for grabbing you by the hair, pulling you out of the water because you're going to drown, and at the same time keeping you safe from your damaged hands because the intentions is different. And I know people mm -hmm. who would push that button because the intention is punishment rather than support. And I know that people will choke the collar because they are fearful of the consequences, what the dog could do to them and the consequences to the neighborhood. So the intention is, comes wrong as well. And the dog can sense that. No matter how you deliver the message, the underlying intention is what actually carries that message to your dog. Even if that treat that you want to give your dog comes in with sit, sit, sit. It's an aggressive, intimidating behavior. So that treat is basically punishing your reward. So we need to become aware of the primary and the secondary reinforcers because sometimes we screw that up. Speaking of, um, David, can you share, or I th or Dave, Dan, whoever wants first, can you share a little bit the difference between primary and secondary reinforcer for simple people? Feel free, Dave. Oh, you mean like what's the most important to the dog compared right. to kind of what's insignificant or neutral? Right. Well, um, we well yeah, that's how we pair relationships. You know, that's how we build trust. Um, that's how we get the dog to do things that we want them to do. Um, that principle. I was going to be too long, especially if they're fearful they don't know who meet people want them to for David I guess can you guys hear me? um we have really you just came back in right um I'll message you so you can see what what we need um, Dan, okay, my start? apologies. I'm not no, sure no what you guys got there. Dan, can you step out for that? Sure. Um, what uh, I've learned about primary... primary... No, go ahead, Dan. What I've learned about primary okay. reinforcements is it has to do with... You said are based on the organism's survival. So shelter, safety, food... Um, reproduction mm -hmm. and in secondary reinforcers are things that we could condition. So we might use, um, let's say a clicker. So we click the device, we offer something the dog loves. We do that click food, click food until the association is the click becomes a secondary reinforcer. It means something good is going to happen. And so things that are secondary reinforcers can be useful in training because we can't necessarily provide the primary reinforcers other than food for survival. We can't suddenly provide shelter and we're not going to provide a, a mate for reproduction and that sort of thing. They're impractical. 
So food or toys, um, a dog that enjoys a toy, that could become a reinforcer. Um, maybe a fetch. People who train in um, sports like agility very often use a tug toy. They get a dog really amped up, and then they release them on the course. <laughs> and when they finish the course, they come back, and they get to play that game again. So that's a big reinforcer, secondary reinforcer. Mm -hmm. It's good I to see. have lots of options. Right. That's why it's important to understand the dog's primary reinforcers because the relationship is a primary reinforcer, and dogs will offer behaviors for that. So um, if I reject my relationship because my dog misbehaving, I put my dog automatically in a survival mode. While I'm trying to put a positive reinforcement to the equation, I'm starting with a negative punisher and the primary reinforcer. I remove myself, uh, sorry, a positive punisher in the, in the primary enforcer, removing myself with my dog's need because I don't like my dog anymore. He's misbehaving. But the dog doesn't. He wants to behave. He doesn't know how. And this is where we come in if we come in as authoritarian as a parent. And we want the dog to behave without explaining him rather than coming in as authoritative and says, you know what, let me explain to you what I want to do. If you do this, I call it that. And if you do that, I'll reward you. Can I make my dog make that more often? So if we go back for an example, my dog is running out the door. And my goal is my dog not to run out the door. And what if I can teach my dog that the only way to run out the door is with my permission? It's something we can do together. You and me will run out of the door. But we are a team. I appreciate you and you appreciate me and I don't appreciate you running alone because we're not part of the team. So starting from a relationship will give the dog the primary reinforcer to do things for you, not only for the treats, just in case you don't like treats and just in case you don't like cookie cutting and just in case you don't like petting the dog for something that you don't know what he does. But you know he will do things for you if you come in as... Um, supporter as a member of his family as a teammate as clear giving the dog oh i think we have debbie back yep yes yeah, so i there. got closer to the router my apologies yeah that's good <laughs> and so once you come from that perspective then the dog starts offering behaviors for that now you cannot get it like this of course you can take a shortcut but usually it's going to fail long term what you need to do here is you need to start building your relationship being consistent, not having your dog always beg for the solution, but you being willingly to offer, coming with an abundance of solutions, an abundance of explanations, with abundance of safety, that dog would be sick not to follow you because, dude, would you leave money behind? Would you leave safety? Would you leave your house living in the garbage bin? No, it's a common sense because, again, the primary reinforcer is safety, is shelter, and it comes into one umbrella, you. So yeah. why would you give up that important primary enforcer going to a secondary enforcer forcing it? Because environmental factors that are controlled by human are the secondary enforcers. And guess who's going to push the clicker? And guess who's going to give the treat? And guess who's going to push the button? And guess who's going to pull the leash? Well, all the dynamic is in the primary enforcer. We do things because of us. So once we teach the dog that we have ability to communicate, I'm listening to your problem. I'm offering you a solution. Like you coming in as a, as a behaviorist or as a police officer and tell this person, hey, man, that's really fucked up. What is the problem? How can I help you? I'm not a threat. I'm here to help you. Give me an opportunity to help you. Tell me what's happening here. Why do you feel this way? What triggers you? Mm -hmm. Right? And then that person is finally, for the first time in his life, is somebody there asking that question. How can I help you? Sure. Because the reason why he's pulling that gun, the reason why he's getting violent, because he believes that he's not our choice. And I think the key factor is, give the dog choices to start with. And I, I offer this two treat exercise. Hey, here's two treats. 
which one do you want? And your dog is like, holy bark, you know what? I want both treats. Well, how do you get those? Can you help me? Sure, here you go. And your dog is like, holy bark, it just has happened. Like, I'm checking in on you, I get both treats. That's a cool troubleshooting skills. Can I do that again? Sure, try again. Here, which one do you want? Let him smell it, let him drool, let his drive go kicks in, and then let him choose which one does he want. He's like, I don't know which to pick one. Can you help me? Sure, here you go. And now you convey the message. If you're in trouble, where do you go? Duh, to me. Did I teach the dog to do that? No, it was his idea to look at me. I didn't force him. I didn't lure him with treats to look at me. But that choice helped him survive. Where does this information go? It goes into his survival instinct programming system, right hardwired in that system. If I need somebody to help, I will go to my partner. Okay. And I guarantee, and I, I'm sure you may you know, confirm it, as a police officer going into the field with a partner, Feels awesome. Feels safe. You have somebody on your back. If your gun fails, you have a second one. I, I was in the war, not not with with NATO, but I was in Austria, and I was felt very safe having partners to me that covers my flanks while I was in the middle of shooting situation. At least if I get killed or hurt, I have somebody who will pull me out of it. It felt good. It felt safe. I I felt safe being in my hole waiting for things to get over i got you right make sense and i feel we have to give a clear message the reason why the dog is about to fail and the reason why the dog fails in his behavior is because we haven't established that sense of safety and he's forced to do things that he feels he has to because there is no other option i need to my dog is complaining and i don't want to preach in a choir but you guys uh, keep talking. Um, um, David, say something now that you can. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the most important thing, first and foremost, is to teach the dog what you want them to do. Give them outlets, alternative behaviors to the uh, reactionary behaviors. You know, And then when people feel the need to add aversives, that's reactionary as well. So you want to get proactive. You want to know your dog, anticipate what they're going to do and redirect them before they have a chance to escalate. You know, once you can get in their mind and change their way of thinking early on those micro warning signals that this could go sideways and redirect them, adding distance obviously is our best friend with dealing with reaction and fear, you know, by, by taking that initiative, that puts you in charge and that really marks in their head like, whoa, this person understands me. This person knows how I'm feeling because by them taking charge and adding distance, now I'm able to deescalate and feel better and look to them. And OK, now I can just look to them and I can give up all of that self-defense kind of stuff because I know my master's going to handle it, even if it's just by adding distance, since we can't control everything. But we can mark those triggers as good things, not scary, you know, not like no or bad. If they're looking at a dog that they're scared of, it's like, yes, good boy. It's a good guy. Come on, let's go this way. Redirect focus every time they look at a trigger. Yes, mark it as a good thing. Upbeat, happy. You know, if you project this upbeat, happy, no big deal energy, you know, they are going to fall into that. Oh, hey, we're playing. We're having a game. Dad's happy. I'm happy. But if you're like all stressed and like, ah, you know, no, they're going to get aggressive that validates their stress and aggression. So it's trying to get people to change their, you know, conscious of their emotions and change that at those times. That's going to get a change in behavior in the dog. Absolutely. I want to point something out um, I, from, my, from my perspective as a triggered person, like PTSD, and I also see it with clients a lot, also with people who are online clients or local clients. It doesn't matter. You guys work with that too. I recognize, um, to be specific, I remember a case in Austin, Texas. I was working with a Great Dane puppy. He was about eight months old. He was really big. Um, he was already 110 pounds. I come into the house, and the person is like, my dog is a killer. And I was like, it doesn't look to me like a killer. And he's kind of friendly, you know, jumping a little bit, which is normal. He gave him a treat. He set for it. Everything was perfect. And then 
he jumped a second time and then the person said no that dog went cujo if i didn't have my hand in front of me that dog would go in my throat and i was like whoa can you please don't use that word again that no is a trigger just yeah, almost like it. an attack word yeah yeah because no was associated with punishment and punishment was associated with a person and the reason why the dog felt me as a threat because he saw that association no equals punishment and the reason i wa it was the person so no was becoming a trigger how the dog felt like about the person right. and so the dog is going into a negative thinking pattern the moment we have the trigger and if that negative thinking pattern i did actually a video yesterday uh, maybe i can share it the moment the dog has to make a decision right or left positive thought negative thought if that dog is punished to have a positive thought or is never reinforced to have a positive thought he automatically will go in worst case scenario because he's in a survival mode and how do i get my dog out so if a word can cause emotions and emotions can cause you say words and emotions can trigger your body and your body can trigger emotions then we can see that we have a, a weird triangle here if you don't observe all these three angles we're going to fail the dog telling him no punishing him while he sees a person he's being triggered by he wants to kill that person because every time he sees that person he's going to get punished yeah now a dog who is on a fence and a dog who is on a fence collar sees these kids playing around and he's getting punished for trying to get rid of them how does he feel about kids how does he feel about his property how does he feel about his emotions he will end up if that system fails because of a grounding error because of somebody cut the grass and cut the wire and you don't know because you see the e color working because the bulb is lighting and the system is failure because the wire doesn't work or the loop is broken or the wire is displaced in another location and the dog will go through the fence and that person gets killed hurt injured so we cannot risk that if the dog doesn't have his conscious understanding whether or not he should make that call as much as Dan as a police officer has morals and ethics to rely on whether or not to pull that trigger or whether or not to help that dog if the dog doesn't have this moral and ethical compass he will not make right decisions and especially with dog dogs who are being coming in from a shelter environment or coming in from an abuse home or they're stray on the streets they don't have the family code of conduct they have no clue what to do if we don't teach them that first so I would, you can never ever punish a dog anyway but you cannot address an issue if the laws are not in place if the dog doesn't understand that this property is part of us and it's not his and that you have a saying to that because we're both doing a job here and right now i don't appreciate doing the job instead i would appreciate if you do this if you don't clarify and frame the dog's job description no matter what breed it is you will never be able to call him off the job and so if the dog wants to run out because he feels that mailman has to be taken down because he's invading the property uninvited he comes in figures with the door takes things in and walks away well that person has to stop from from doing but why does the dog think that in the first place why does he think that this person is invading our house because i reinforce him every time he's concerned <gasps> who is it who is this well thank you for telling me that he is somebody and then i'm correcting my dog for that and my dog wants that to stop from happening and the dog doesn't have another option he doesn't know how to us to change it but at some point you can tell him hey going to that place is a good way to tell me that we have an invader and once we have that information in place then we can set up a whole program because of that and thank you for telling me that and i totally agree with that guy being in our property but we need him 
but I would appreciate you going to your bed and I reward you for that. So if you see that person, come to me so I can give you the right job description because I appreciate that rather than this. And only in that option, if you say, for example, and I'm not a police officer again, they then can explain that better. If a person wants help and you offer a problem, which directions do you think the person will go? He will cause a problem in exchange. But if I offer him a solution because he wants his emotions to calm down, it's a natural instinct for us to try to keep our heart rate low and a sympathetic system not firing, he will take that help if it comes in from a right angle. Hey, I'm with you. We should kill that guy, but not today. How about we go back in the house and deal with that later? Because right now, I don't think it's a good idea. Being emotional, intelligent, right that moment when the shit hits the fan, teaching the dog that walking away is an option that is appreciated, the dog will likely let go of that problem. Not in the first round because we have this negative thinking loop that we have to overcome. And we have this predictability of that event is going to happen again and how do I get out of there? How about if I say a word, shark or spider, people react to that. Ew. And how about I say shark vacuum cleaner and Spider-Man? Ah. And how about I say now shark and spider and people like, oh. Because we give the mind an escape route instead of negative thinking, which is a problem, into a positive possibility. And all of a sudden, the shark becomes a fish and an ocean and the spider becomes a cartoon because our brain tries to get away from that pressure. So if I punish my dog and if I challenge my dog, what did you do? Why did you peer my carpet? Who's a bad boy? I'm causing an emotional pressure, leaving the dog only with one route, feeling the victim and reacting to that. Is it about the pizza? Is it about the toilet paper roll? Is it about the toys child? sock whatever is the way i deliver the message to my dog what is appropriate in our family if you have a sock i'm gonna take it away anyway because i don't care about your emotions i'm not giving anything in exchange you're supposed not to have that sock in your mouth not knowing that a dog naturally will pick up whatever is free on the floor if it's so important to you why do you leave it there i guess if it's yours, take it with you. Be territorial about it. Don't leave it out there because I guess you don't need it anymore. So I chew on it because I love your sandwich and fries tasting remote control. I love it. It's good to chew on. Make sense? Yeah. I feel sure. The general message of today, David, what do you what do you think people should take away from our conversation today? Mm -hmm. What, do, what people actually take away from our conversation to start with? <laughs> well, I think the most important thing with addressing aggression is to not address the aggression. You have to address what's causing the dog to want to be aggressive. And if you change that, you change that association, how the dog feels about that trigger, their responses will change. People try to focus on the reaction and not the proaction you know so if you can get in the dog's head and change that association um it will definitely definitely minimize aggressive reactions but it has to be there has to be a bond of trust between the dog and the person you can't just come in there and just start demanding the dog not be aggressive you know you have to build a relationship of understanding and communication and when the dog trusts you and has a good recall and then you can project energy onto the dog like how to feel about certain things because sometimes they're not sure how to feel that's why they freeze they're like oh what should i do and if you're like yes good boy that's going to get them into wiggle butt instead of they're freezing and you're like ah no you know that could startle them into a reaction so be aware of your emotions, how you're working with your dog. Take a proactive approach and address the root cause of the aggression and you're moving in the right direction. I think that's that's all spot on. Dan, what, what do you what do you think people should take away from today? I agree with that too. And I think aggressive behavior is something that 
might be best addressed by a professional. So I would encourage pet owners to seek out somebody who's a qualified that would use reward-based methods and that has an understanding of behavior to at least get them started. Um, I've, I know there are lots of books written on how to deal with regression. I'm going to hold one up hoping that people can see it. Pat Miller mm -hmm. wrote oh, an yes. excellent dog a training book to deal with aggressive behavior, and it's written for pet owners as well as professionals. So that would be a good start. And She's you wonderful. can go to organizations. There are uh, trainer organizations like the IAABC and PPG that have directories where you could search for a trainer in your locale. And then you have somebody to work with who has a lot of experience uh, and they can get you on the right path. Yeah, I, I agree with you. So just for us to give up, David, our co-host um, is easy to reach. Um, also our special guest, Daniel, you can reach out to Happy Buddha Dog Training. From, as for my thing, I, I usually work with people online and remotely, I specialize in large breeds, aggression, um, trauma-based behaviors. We can work online. I do this since 2009, full-time, basically. And I feel my takeaway from that is before you do anything with your dog, before you actually become social with your dog, you have to establish a secure attachment relationship where your dog starts trusting you. You have to come from a perspective that a dog can easily show you his emotions without feeling the need or afraid to be punished. And once we have that established and the dog is willingly showing you his emotions and you will be able to offer solutions to his problems, then he will likely refer to you like, hey, I have a problem with this. He's staring at me. Can you help me? And that will give you enough time in that high speed thinking of a dog to say, hmm, we can walk away with it. Let's go. And if the dog doesn't have obedience skills, it's not because you fail teaching those. It's because it doesn't see the necessity to follow them by you if he is in a problem situation. So the dog should know that if you ask him for obedience, he will not get punished for not following them because some methods are punishing if you don't do what I'm telling you to do, but should come in from a positive perspective. That what you just did on your own, I call it sit. That what you did on your own was, I call it lay down. That what you call walking next to me, I call it let's go or heal. And the dog is like, oh, oh, just now you, you tell me, this is what I wanted to do. Yeah, I give my dog that option, that escape route of fear into obedience that leads him to a safe place. Would you trust a rescue person that looks to you like a thief? No. Would you trust a person that looks to you like an officer? Okay, it's a s sensitive mm -hmm. thing right now. But if the person is a rescue, an officer, or a fireman, and you are in need for help, would you go with this person telling you, hey, I'm here to help you. Grab my hand. Let's go. Of course you would. Now, from that perspective, I think we should always start with secure attachment relationship, building trust, start creating the frame of the social rules that we have in place, family code of conduct and social skills, and then expose the dog to a problem. And that's why as soon as you have the dog, you have four weeks to establish that. Secure attachment, safety, trust, building social rules, and generalizing. And those tools you take out in social settings and start teaching your dog what to do with simple triggers. <gasps> we saw a squirrel. Oh, that was funny. How would he do with that? <laughs> right? Oh, you saw a garbage bin that stares at you and you need to growl about it. How about we walk around that and see it from different angles? How about that car that stares at you looks like an owl ready to kill you and attack you? Coming low with his low tires looks like a salamander or crocodile, whatever. <laughs> triggers you, your prey your, your feel of prey, oh, that's actually a car. We can have fun with it. Cool, right? And from there, 
then you go into difficult situations and play with the idea of what would you do if a dog barks at you like crazy and wants to kill you, but we are here safe, you with me, we're doing our own thing. Who gives a bark about that stupid dog staring at us or barking at us because we mind our own business? Let's keep going, my friend. <laughs> of course, you can go the other route. Of course, you can use the e-collar and shock collar and punishing because you feel that's the best way to go. But I feel that's a short, short path that you're going to end up in a dead end. You always end up in a dead end. Because on another point, and sorry, I took over here, is that we're buying into the proofs that are actually not real, that there's like lobbying of these multi-million dollar companies. They want you to buy that prong collar. They want you to buy their product. They want you to use those tools. They want you, that dog, to make you feel miserable because they can sell through fear porn. And that fear porn, if you look all these YouTube videos of those people who promote those things, the first thing they say, your dog is going to get killed by a car. Your dog is going to be shot by the neighbor. Your dog will not follow your instructions. That will solve the problem. He will follow your instructions 100%. There is guarantee your dog will never leave the house. Of course, if you go downtown New York, sit in a taxi with a gun in your hand and say, hi, buddy, how are you doing? I would like to drive home. Do you want my address? What do you think is going to happen next? Will this person question you? All start keep driving the address you gave him. Did that do anything to that person? Did you point the gun on him? No, you were just holding a gun. What's the problem having a gun? I can carry a gun. I have a license, right? How does this person feel about my behavior? Is what makes the event good or bad? And I feel if we look at the dog's perspective, how the dogs perceive your method and how the dog feels your behavior is what matters i can be a narcissist and blame my dog for failing and i can be a narcissist and says my dog has to behave and my dog has to do this and that because that's what dogs do that's what i want my dog to do because i want to look good i feel we have a problem here and we have to point that out and i'll take the hit for that i'll call it out these behaviors are wrong this idea of correcting a dog who has an emotional issue with something is wrong to be corrected, punished, or silenced. We talk about violence, we talk about abuse, it's right there in front of our eyes, but we try to choose convenience over education. I think that's what I feel people should take away from it. And I, I like the conversation we had today because we didn't blame people did we? Did I come in as blaming people? I hope not. It was not my intention. I apologize. I think we should offering people alternative solutions to their ch choice of saving their dog from bolting out the house. And I think maybe if you guys want, I, I like I like our, our energy that we have here. Maybe next time, and may, I saw people, um, we did a, a, a resort, a question. Uh, the first one was separation anxiety people use shock collars for separation, use confinement for separation anxiety, use spray collars for separation anxiety. And the second would be multiple dog homes. What do we do with dogs with multiple dogs in the house? Because with multiple behavior have, issues. Exactly. Multiple dynamics. Uh, and people resort to spray collars, shock collars, um, you know, prong collars and shake cans and spray bottles and yelling and confinement and all these old tools that basically create an unstable environment that's about to burst in front of your house. And of course, it will be one dog's fault, the one you suspected, because he's the one who steps up for everything. He wants that to stop from happening. And then we punish that dog too. So what do you guys feel? You, you should talk about next time about using other than aversive tools for separation anxiety do you guys have any other managing multiple dogs especially you yeah. know that's a common problem people have whether it's from vast size or age age differentials or litter mates um you know many different issues can come into play there so yeah i think that would be a good one awesome i i really so i really 
really appreciate you guys for being here. <laughs> I know I sound silly, Likewise, right? Man. But I really appreciate you guys taking time from your time. You guys are professionals. You, you, you're supposed to work. But now you choose here sharing knowledge and, and helping people help their dogs, not being punished, not being hurt, not failing. Okay, I think I, I love that. Thank you so much for joining here. Sorry, David has a hard time logging in. Um, I feel the best thing to do is hardwiring on the internet as possible because Wi-Fi kind of suppresses a little bit uh, and routers kind of get more data through the wire than through Wi-Fi. Okay. And uh, got it, if you guys have any questions, again, here, keep it short, get a screenshot. You can reach David through zenk9.org. You can reach... Um, Daniel through happy Buddha dog training. I spelled it right, right? Dot com. And you can reach me at any time through holistic dog training dot org slash online training. Just to give you an idea, there is no way we cannot solve a problem unless you want to get rid of the dog because we don't take any dogs. But anything else we can do. Thank you. Thank you so much, you both guys. You're very welcome. Thank you, guys. Bye -bye. Have a great week. We'll see you next time. Bye now. Bye bye. Right. This is Coffee with Holistic Dog Professionals. Learn from Roman and David how to become your dog's best friend.